Hi, everybody, and welcome to my brief presentation on CBG, or cannabigerol. Um, the first thing I wanted to address is what is CBG, because you may not have heard of it, or you may have heard of it and don't really know what it's all, all about, and, and you know what, it, what is it actually doing, and where is it coming from. CBG, um, and again, this is without getting into the pathway, um, without actually showing you the pathway, CBG is one of the main precursors in um, in hemp and um, cannabis, which is really the same thing. Um, and you know those are basically the same species, just different varieties. CBG is, like I said, it's a precursor. That means that a lot of the other cannabinoids, such as THC um, and CBD, they are derived from CBG. So that's one of the main starting points in the biosynth biosynthesis pathway in the plant. So the truth is it's actually um, all the acids in the plant, that would be CBGA, um, would be converted into THCA or CBDA. And in order to get rid of the acid component, um, you just generally would use heat or um, time. And it's kind of a natural process where it loses that acid component. So then we have CBG. So why do we even care about CBG if, if that's just the starting point in the pathway? Um, why would we even have CBG um, it, you know, available to us on the market? And the answer to that is, be, is because some you know, you know, intelligent scientists have figured out that they can force the plants to produce a lot of CBG um, by preventing conversion to THCA and CBDA. Um, so basically, they're gonna, these plants are going to produce excess CBGA um, by blocking that, that pathway um, artificially or genetic or through genetic um, recombination or just breeding, you know. So breeding, breeding out that pathway um, just by chance that will happen if you, you know, you grow enough plants um, and you have enough, you know, variety and mutations maybe you'll find one that's not converting the CBG or the CBGA specifically. So then we have, um, we have a lot of CBGA in some plants and that could be extracted, okay? And that could be purified and it is on the market. Um, it's on the, I've seen it in um, actually dog treats. Um, I've seen it in some other products. Um, so the point here that I wanted to make is that you know, compared to all the other cannabinoids, which by the way, there's at least 120 known cannabinoids in these plants, but compared to all the other cannabinoids, CBG was one of the most interesting ones to me because it's the only one that we're aware of that um, affects a receptor that is very different from um, the actual regular THC or CBD receptors. So that would be the alpha-2 receptor. And, and the reason why that interests me is because I teach cardiovascular pharmacology and the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor has a major role in uh, regulating the sympathetic nervous system. So I'm going to get into that. Um, and I only have a few slides here. This is going to be one of my quickest presentations, but I thought I'd, I really needed to give you that background. Okay, so it's the, the main focus here is what should we be concerned about uh, in relation to CBG use in animals and humans and um, blood pressure. So uh, first thing I'll say here is uh, we don't really know exactly how it's gonna work in humans um, because most of the tests have been really in animals. So just bear that in mind and, and I'll say, like I've said in the other presentations, um, none of this is uh, to be interpreted as medical advice. Okay, so this is my best interpretation of what the literature has now. Um, on CBG, okay, and it's, a, it's a, an amalgamation of my knowledge of, of a, a few different fields to synthesize this. Again, it's not medical advice. So I'm going to jump right to, um, to my knowledge, the first article that showed that the CBG is unique. So in 2010, um, M. Caschio, and I might have hacked up that name, and I apologize if I pronounced it wrong and you're listening, but Casco et al. Uh, reported that CBG was a highly potent alpha-2 adrenoceptor agonist. Okay, so if you're not a scientist, you're not a pharmacist, um, or, or 
in, you know, in the healthcare field, you might be already asking, what are we talking about already? This is very confusing. So an agonist just typically means, well, to simplify it, it means an activator. And the alpha-2 adrenoceptor is just a receptor that binds to these activators or agonists. And that will be present on um, mostly neurons, okay, neurons in the sympathetic nervous system, which is what you will be activating when you are excited, when, you know, when you're running, when you're nervous, that's your sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight. It does have alpha-2 receptors um, on neurons. And um, the interesting thing about those receptors is rather than being um, receptors that hyperactivate um, or stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, they actually serve as a negative feedback mechanism to prevent excess release of norepinephrine or, or noradrenaline. If you're, you know, if you're in another, if you're not in the United States, you might be calling it noradrenaline. But that is your major neurotransmitter that in the sympathetic nervous system that's coming from these neurons. Um, CBG had a similar affinity for the alpha-2 receptor as the drug clonidine. Clonidine has been used for decades as an antihypertensive. Now it appears to be used more often for things like ADHD and Tourette syndrome because it does have a sedating type of effect or, or, or a, a, a reduction in uh, neuro, neurotransmission, um, sympathetic neurotransmission in the brain. And of course, also sympathetic neurotransmission in the peripheral nervous system. And that means, um, it's, again, it's going to affect blood pressure. It's going to affect heart rate. Um, so clonidine does lower heart rate and blood pressure. CBG binds to the same receptor. Okay. And, and you might've heard catapress instead of clonidine. And that's just the brand name that used to be used for quite a while um, as a patch, um, maybe some other dosage forms. But the first point is that, yeah, so CBG is about equal affinity. That just means it binds about the same, uh, with the same amount of binding attraction or binding affinity as clonidine. So they both have about the same interest or strength in binding to the alpha-2 receptor. So that's only the first point. But as a pharmacologist, that's definitely not enough for me to know. I need to know more than that. And we need to know what happens when it does bind. And it's now it's been proven that when uh, CBG does bind, it does act the same way as clonidine in that that is an agonist or activator, okay? Which remember, this is a negative feedback mechanism. So when you activate alpha-2 receptors, it actually suppresses or reduces release of that neurotransmitter norepinephrine. So it's a generally uh, suppressing, so sedating, suppressing, um, so reducing activity in many cases. So again, ADHD, Tourette's, lowering blood pressure, and there's the reference at the bottom. So I, I think I just needed to use one of my um, one of my animations here just to make it clear what's happening, um, particularly if anyone's in neurosciences or uh, pharmacology or med school, this might be uh, much more uh, familiar to you, but what is happening here, um, and this is supposed to be a presynaptic neuron, um, that means a neuron that was preceding another neuron, or um, even a neuron at the neuromuscular junction where you have this neuron releasing norepinephrine onto a muscle. Uh, for example, um, the vascular smooth muscle where you have constriction. So the what I want to show you here briefly is that when you activate this Again, this is the presynaptic alpha-2 receptor. Okay, when you activate it, okay, with either clonidine or CBG or even tizanidine, which is um, a skeletal muscle relaxant, they all do the same thing. You activate alpha-2, and I'm going to show you this brief animation, but that um, in a second, but that is going to stimulate the potassium channel to force potassium out, or actually allow it out because it wants to get out. When you allow potassium out that makes the inside relatively negative in charge, and that prevents this voltage-gated calcium channel from opening, and that forces the calcium to stay extracellular layer outside the neuron. And if calcium can't get in, um, the vesicle containing the neurons, uh, I'm sorry, the vesicle containing the neurotransmitter will not be released, it will not fuse with the membrane, and will not release its norepinephrine, which, um, the upshot of that means you have 
less sympathetic activity. So here's a, the brief animation. So alpha-2 is activated. That opens up, opens up the potassium channel. Potassium rushes out because it's uh, relatively concentrated inside, so it wants to get out. That produces a negative charge throughout the, uh, the inside, so in the cytosol. That negative charge actually blocks the calcium channel from opening. Calcium can't get in. And without calcium, you do not have uh, vesicle release, like I said. So that, tr you know, I'm just anthropomorphizing, saying it's trying to get out. Um, the point is it's not going to be getting out, and it won't, it won't be releasing norepinephrine. And what that means is it won't be stimulating uh, neurons in the central nervous system. It won't be stimulating vascular smooth muscle, so it won't be causing constriction of blood vessels. It won't be stimulating beta-1 receptors on the heart. Uh, that means it won't be stimulating heart rate or force of contraction. So everything gets suppressed. Okay, so maybe that sounds good, right? Because we're talking about a society, at least in the United States, where blood pressure uh, elevation is usually the problem. So, okay, so maybe that's uh, it's tempting to say, well, this is a positive thing then. Um, so the reason why that's a problem, that I guess that um, assumption is because patients may already be on um, antihypertensive medications. Um, they may not be aware of this effect and that may duplicate it. Um, or animals, you know, animals uh, may be given uh, an, an, an abundance of treats that contain CBG without the, you know, with the, without the owner really knowing um, you know, knowing what's going to happen with the animal's blood pressure. So on the next slide here, I'll show you um, kind of more summary points of the main issues. So these are the thoughts and recommendation. Uh, so I say recommendation because there's really one main recommendation that I have. So first of all, CBG um, has real risks associated with blood pressure. The extent of these risks in pets and humans is unknown. So what I'll say, and I don't have the reference here, but um, what I've seen is that studies have been done in animals, specifically mice, and showed that yes, CBG does lower blood pressure in mice, okay? But whether or not that's going to translate to that effect in humans, we're not sure. But in most cases, these adrenergic receptors function very similarly from species to species. So my best guess and again, it's only a guess is that, yes, humans will probably have a lower blood pressure if given enough CBG. Um, the main point, though, is that blood pressure, sh blood pressure is likely to change one way or the other. So it's something we need to be aware of. So I'm predicting some obvious CBG drug interactions that may occur. Um, CBG may lower blood pressure and heart rate. So if you give it with clonidine, um, if you're already on clonidine, then there's a higher risk of duplicating that pharmacology. If you are um, taking any other antihypertensive, there's a risk there. If you're taking a beta blocker to lower your heart rate, CBG may make that more uh, lowered. It would lower it more, okay, and things like that that we have to worry about. On the other hand, if you're using something uh, like a pre-workout that has yohimbine in it, uh, which is historically it's been used for weight loss uh, because it is a stimulant and um, for energy and things like that. But yohimbine is a direct antagonist of alpha-2 receptors. So that's an over-the-counter product, obviously, the yohimbine. And so what that would do is actually it would oppose the effects of CBG um, if, if what we're seeing in animals translates to what is going to happen in humans. And again, that's not totally known yet. Um, the effects may be more pronounced, like I said, in patients taking other medications. In actuality, we don't know the effects in humans and cannot ever rely on animal studies um, for, for you know, decades and decades or maybe even more than a century. We found sometimes animal studies don't translate to human, uh, we can't extrapolate to the human um, results, okay, or the expectation of whatever happens in an animal, what happened in a human. They metabolize drugs differently. They have different organ sizes relative to their body size, so different liver size, things like that. Um, they have different receptor genetics, like so the actual genotypes of the, re the receptors or the sequence of those genes may be different, which may translate to different affinities for the, for the drugs or natural products. So my suggestion 
is to avoid CBG until information is gathered about its effects on blood pressure. And the reason why I like to emphasize that is because when I discovered that its affinity for the alpha-2 receptor is similar to clonidine, that actually scared me a little bit because knowing that it's already out there, the CBG, if people take that as if it is just inert or has no real toxicity associated with it, they may substantially overdose on it. Uh, overdose in the sense that um, they may cause severe uh, hypotension or blood pressure lowering. So I probably may, still made this longer than I wanted to, but thank you for listening and I hope you learned something. Um, I really, I'm really excited to hear comments because I, I think there's a really interesting area that is not getting enough recognition, um, the toxicity of CBG or the potential toxicity. So again, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it.